and welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Today we're excited to have our guest speaker, Jim Cox, Director of the Stoddard Bird Lab up here at Tall Timbers Research Station. Today, Jim will be giving a presentation discussing the influence of prescribed fire on bird habitat in the southeastern U.S. Jim Cox is the well-known director of the Stoddard Bird Lab at Tall Timbers Research Station north of Tallahassee. He spends most of his time studying bird species that are declining in southern pine forests. He's also engaged in conservation efforts designed to work closely with regional private landowners to protect habitat for rare species. In addition, he's very busy. He continues to support programs and events to recruit new folks into the birding community. So welcome, Jim. We're excited to have you here with us today. I'm really looking forward to, forward to your presentation. And just one second here as we go ahead and pull up your slideshow and, and you can take it away. Thanks, Dave. And I hope everyone is, um, if we have weather like uh, we're having here, is looking for, forward to birding later this afternoon. Uh, right after this, if the relative humidity drops a bit more, we're hoping to burn about 200 acres here on Tall Timbers a little bit later. Um, appreciate everyone taking time again. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the effects of fire frequency and season on uh, birds here in the southeastern area, um, with a strong focus on the uh, longleaf pine ecosystems that we have throughout much of the much of the southeast. You know, it's a very high frequency fire return interval here. It's been going on for thousands of years, and organisms have developed a lot of um, methods for dealing with fire. If they hadn't developed them, they wouldn't wouldn't be occurring here. Uh, some of the estimates historically for the fire intervals that we have here is up to two years or more frequently, and uh, spanning up to somewhere around two to four years elsewhere in the southeast here. This, of course, overlaps uh, significantly with the former range of the longleaf pine forest, um, one of North America's richest forest systems, um, covered a million, uh, 90 million acres historically, uh, dominated about 60 million acres within that range, and was um, one of the largest ecosystems in North America dominated by a single species of, of conifer, and also, again, one of the richest systems in terms of the many different types of plants are supported by the, uh, in, in the longleaf setting. Look at the longleaf setting. Um, it's a grassy area with an overstory of pines, and that's the kind of way we like to think of these areas as being pine grassland systems. Uh, here's a, pin, a picture taken from the Pensacola area, uh, early 1900s, showing the uh, wonderful setting there historically. Um, magnificent trees that are widely spaced and the lush uh, uh, ground cover uh, filled with all sites, types of different plant species. Another shot in Louisiana showing a similar thing uh, with, again, um, a lot of, lot of longleaf pine, uh, not much mid-story, and then the open ground cover. Again, this is one of my favorite shots taken over near Louisiana. Early accounts uh, describe fires occurring through the system very regularly. Uh, very honest, in 1580, you saw great fires along the Carolina coast. Uh, Francis Drake in the late 1500s, uh, one special great fire, which are very ordinary uh, along the coast. And then Bartram in the late 1700s talked about riding through the high open pine forests, uh, having lately been burned, uh, the flowery savanna. Uh, all these historic accounts given us some idea about the, uh, you know, that these systems uh, receive fire very regularly. We have a little more precise estimate here. Uh, based on some work done by Gene Huffman at Louisiana State University and at the University of Florida, uh, looking at historic fire regimes in our southern pinelands. Uh, by looking at scars on old uh, stumps, she was able to sort of date back fires um, many, 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 many decades, back into the uh, late 1500s, 1600s, finding stumps of some ancient pines up here in the northwest Florida region. These scars, um, when fire comes through, leaves a wound on the tree and is healed over, but you can get some idea about how the frequency, if you can match up a bunch of these scars from a bunch of different stumps. Basically, Gene's work uh, from late 1600s to middle 1800s, so the average return interval was two to three years, and about 92% of all the fires occur within five years, so it's a very high frequency uh, burning back then uh, when uh, the European influence was not very dramatic here. You look at the intervals we sort of think naturally occurred in Florida, for example, um, 
two to three years for some of our upland pines, three to five for our flatwoods, and then uh, longer systems for some of our marshes and, and scrub settings. Um, basically, about 25% of Florida burned annually. Um, again, it's a phenomenal mate rate of burning here uh, that took place. And again, the plants and animals associated with the system had to have some sort of mechanism for uh, dealing with the fire, or else they wouldn't have uh, been able to persist. On the southern pinelands, I'm going to be talking, focusing on heavily today and some of the other systems. Uh, birds are the most dominant vertebrate group out there. Uh, most species compared to rodents and uh, herps and uh, things like that. Um, and they can provide you with a fine-tuned look uh, at some of the system uh, dynamics. Uh, it's a high species richness. Each of the species kind of picking out, selecting different uh, components in the forest, uh, birds provide you with a very fine, fine scale picture of what's happening, happening in your forest. Birds are also extremely popular. Um, bird watching is the uh, largest, uh, the quickest, most rapidly growing uh, outdoor activity we have in, um, in North America. And this particular shot shows a bunch of British birders trying to get a look at an evening gross beak that showed up uh, over in Great Britain. Um, people are going to be watching and uh, take a, a Birds uh, attract a lot of attention, and knowing how bird populations are faring is very important to a large segment of the uh, public. The southern pinelands we talk, uh, focusing on today um, support about 100 different species, and that doesn't include a lot of birds that just uh, kind of pass through, um, but um, pretty, pretty species-rich area. About 44% of these species are associated with the ground and shrub level, uh, where the uh, fires have the most dramatic effect. About another quarter um, of the species are associated with the mid-story uh, area. And then uh, another 30% or so are associated with the canopy. But again, the, this, the uh, highest proportions are tied to that ground shrub level where the uh, burning is uh, having the, the largest effect on the uh, structure of the vegetation. One of the neat things about this system we have with the longleaf pine in particular is it kind of components, uh, uh, combines again forest and grassland components. Um, on one of the tracks where I work, the Wade Track up near Thomasville, Georgia, uh, we can sometimes have eastern meadowlarks breeding within a couple hundred yards of our red-cockaded woodpeckers. Um, for those of you who know, eastern meadowlarks are like meadows, and uh, again, it just stresses the uh, grassland nature of these systems. Now, picking from that 100 species, which ones you'd like to focus on? Unfortunately, there's been a lot of work done by state agencies on this issue. Um, most of the state agencies have looked at species declining and developed what we call species, a list of uh, species of special conservation concern. So in Florida, the brown-headed nuthatch shown here, a small cavity nesting bird, has been uh, declining at a rapid rate on our breeding bird survey routes, as shown in the lower right. Uh, the left shows the breeding bird atlas records for this bird, and it's virtually uh, become extremely rare south of the Orlando area. And the state lists this as a species of uh, conservation concern. If you look throughout the southeast, I've tallied these uh, different species of conservation concern for all the uh, states in the southeast. And most of us talk today will focus on the top six here. It's things like red woodpecker, backman sparrows, henzo sparrows, shrikes, northern bobwhite, and uh, brown-headed nuthatch and, and grasshopper sparrow. Again, this is a, a list that has brought up um, of interest uh, throughout the southeast for, for these species. I'm going to be focusing on the um, effective frequency, fire frequency, season, the scale or extent at which fires are applied, and also the ignition pat pattern. These are the things that fire practitioners uh, have uh, direct control over, and uh, um, they all have some effect on the, uh, the birds that are associated with these systems. Frequency first. Again, uh, each of these species, the 100 or so species that make use of these areas, have areas within the forest that they're selecting out, and the period within uh, following a fire that they find the uh, conditions suitable. Bachman sparrows, for example, are in an area within weeks after the fire, and they'll maintain residency in that area up to two or three seasons post-fire. Meanwhile, a species like the yellow-breasted chat um, really likes a three-year rough and typically doesn't make use of some of these areas until it's, it's gone at least three years, uh, or else there's a really patchy area that uh, didn't burn up, and may, it'll make use of those unburned patches within areas that are burned. Meanwhile, something like a pine warbler, was, which a canopy species, it'll occur um, throughout the, um, all um, these 
different seasons or um, frequencies of burns uh, from first growing season out to three years post burn. So again, each species is picking out, selecting different vegetative components within the uh, within the larger forest. And again, what you're affecting most with the prescribed fire is that ground cover, where you're just basically giving the uh, ground cover um, a burn off, a haircut, if you will, and returning it to an earlier successional stage um, uh, with the frequency with which you burn. We've done some work. Uh, we have a plot on tall timbers called NB66. Uh, NB stands for not burned since 1966, and it's been suppressed from fire for over 40 years. Uh, you can see that how the stand looked back in 1966 in the top picture of wide open grassy, sort of looks like a reminiscent of a lot of the other pictures we have from um, historic longleaf. In 1981, 15 years later, you can see the hardwood encroachment, uh, mid-story build up there, and then in 2001, how it looks today. Um, the A shown in this particular um, series of slides is the same tree, and the tree was gone by 2001, but just gives you how, uh, an idea about how quickly, for 15 years, the uh, mid-story hardwood can build up once fire is removed. The bird counts conducted here show clearly you know, that some species disappear within just a few years after removal of fire. A loggerhead shrike was recorded for three years once fire was removed and then uh, disappeared. Bachman sparrow was recorded for three years and then disappeared, and subtler other species began to blink out within five or so years after the fire um, was removed. Meanwhile, the lower right-hand portion of the graph, you can see that there are several species that move in as this hardwood develops. Species like wood thrush comes in about 15, 10 to 15 years after the fire has been removed, and the hardwood uh, starts to develop. A lot of people might think that removing fire just simply uh, gives you a, a one of some sort of replacement of the species within the forest, one species replacing another. But here in the southeast, these pinelands are the most species-rich um, systems that we have. And actually on MB66, there's been an overall decline in species richness over the years since fire was removed. Um, beginning early part of the study, there were about 35 species within this 25-acre block. And today, there are uh, barely 20 species, a little over 20 species that make use of the 25-acre block. This has been pretty well documented that the um, uh, several studies that the number of species in the open pinelands, again, because you have mixtures of both the forest and the um, pat, um, grassland structure, that they have high species richness, uh, 28 species per 20 acres in some of our well-managed uh, old growth pinelands. And similar hardwood areas have about 20 species per 20 acres. Now this relationship uh, sort of dissipates the further north you get as you start to add many uh, neotropical migrants that use, uh, make use of the hardwood forests uh, in the northern portion of the uh, southeast. But the, uh, from the coastal plain and into Florida, this is a pretty well uh, established trend. One species of particular concern is the red-cockaded woodpecker, an endangered species. It excavates its cavities only in living pines and requires large areas of mature pines in order to have suitable foraging habitat. It's a bird that most people kind of think of as being up in the canopy and where they think frequent burning uh, might not be as critical, but uh, burning plays a big role in the ecology of this bird on several fronts, not just in terms of vegetation structure, but in some other fundamental um, features. Looking back at MB66, one of the things that uh, can deter woodpeckers is when this mid-story builds up, as you see in the 1981 portion here, they can actually physically um, interfere with the bird's access to their cavities, that, which are tend to be 30 to 50 feet in height. And as this mid-story starts to approach that cavity height, that uh, the birds will abandon the areas uh, because of the uh, encroaching hardwoods. Another interesting thing, the forage quality that the birds are able to uh, experience also is affected by fire. There are a lot of the insects that this bird forages on that have portions of their life history that are tied to the ground cover. Uh, and the work done in the Apalachicola National Forest, south of Tallahassee, for example, there's a greater diversity of the arboreal ants that this bird feeds upon uh, that are areas that are burned three years or more frequently. And these ants form a very important uh, food component uh, for, for the woodpecker. Another interesting thing that is, um, uh, takes place too is that the, a lot of the hardwood shrubs um, sequester and hold calcium uh, much more effectively than the grasses do. You see on this slide the buildup of calcium on the left in the months since fire 
um, it can get a bit uh, pretty pretty thick with the uh, calcium there in, in the shrubs. When the fire takes place, um, a lot of these mineral uh, nutrients are not volatilized. They're returned uh, down back to the ground cover in, in the form of ash and stuff and can be reabsorbed in different uh, different by different species. And for red cocatus, for example, there's actually been shown that the uh, productivity uh, is higher, uh, more eggs are laid in the first year following a fire regardless of whenever the fire takes place. And this could be because of the recycled calcium or as well as improved uh, foraging resources for the for the bird too. But it's a uh, again there's some very important things that fire on the ground is doing for this canopy dwelling species. Another important bird in the southeast is Backman Sparrow. Uh, it's been declining throughout its range and as if in every state is uh, it breeds is listed as a species of conservation concern. We've done a lot of work on this species on the wade track here and um, followed uh, nest success and uh, nest positioning and placement out in the forest. And nest site selection is um, uh, admit less uh, nests on the ground, uh, lays three to four eggs in these nests that sometimes have this dome look, as you can see here. And interesting, the nests tend to face north so that those white eggs aren't exposed to the uh, sunlight from the southern aspect and maybe make it more evident. In the work we've done, we found uh, a lot of nests, 43 of the nests we find that are in the burn area burn last year, and we only find four nests in areas that are scheduled for burns. So most of the nesting activity of this bird is uh, focused on those areas with the most recent burns. As part of this work, we actually measured the vegetation structure around the nest, and then we compared that to the vegetation structure at samples collected at 3, 4, 6, 12, and 18 months after the burn to get an idea about where it was within the successional uh, vegetation, uh, successional pattern for vegetation structure that the, uh, that the birds were selecting for. Just looking at bare ground, the percent of bare ground we were able to measure, it shows how bare ground uh, disappears as the months since burn uh, increases, uh, bare ground making up about 8 to 10 percent of the area there when you're in three months and then slowly declining to less than 5 percent once you're about 18 months post burn. If you want to see where the nests are, they're up here where there's much more bare ground. And if you just sort of follow these trends in these box plots, you can see that once you get about to about 18 uh, months post burn, the conditions that are associated with nest sites are very rare or uh, dwindled significantly. In fact, where we find nest sites in these uh, 18 plus month burns are usually in areas where there's been some sort of mechanical treatment has created a little patch where the vegetation didn't quite grow back as, as quickly as it did in the areas nearby. So again, if you're burning on a two year interval, um, you're burning at a time when there aren't many nests out there on, on the, the patch that you're planning to burn. All the nests are in the areas that were in the area you burned uh, last year, previous year. Again, it's easy to sort of see how this is as you look at the vegetation structure at ground level. This is a bird that makes a living uh, foraging on the ground. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a six months post burn. You can see the little areas in between the bunch grasses that the birds can move around real easily. The grass itself has an erect structure that enables the movement to take place uh, fairly easily. And then looking on the right at 18 months post burn, the uh, wire grass has begun to senesce and fold it over and started to clog up the ground level. Another species of concern here in the southeast is Henslow Sparrow. It breeds far to the north in the prairies where it likes a uh, uh, three to five year uh, burn intervals. But down here in the southeast, it tends to like a little more frequent burning. It's a species of conservation concern. Uh, if, at one point, it was thought to be the songbird with the most rapidly declining population trends of any bird in North America. And the global population is a little higher than estimated here in this slide is up around 150,000 or so, but still it's a, it's a rare bird uh, from that, um, that we have in wintering in the southeast in our pinelands and other areas. So some work done over in Louisiana, basically these birds are looking for the most recent burn sites again here in the southeast. Shown here are flush counts and the thing the point paying attention to are the solid squares showing that the flush counts are higher in the areas that received the burn in the year that the uh, surveys were conducted. The open squares indicate that they were sampled in the area where the burn was conducted a year before that. Uh, so, uh, so again, the birds are using freshly burned areas and not necessarily areas that burned two years uh, prior to them. So in terms of frequency, for most of these species of conservation concern, a three year or less return interval at best meets the needs of these declining grassland birds, pine grassland birds in the southeast. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen this uh, pretty much. It's um, it matches up with the historic burn uh, trends that we've seen through the dendrochronology work that Gene Huffman did. And again, a lot of these birds have uh, life history traits that are very much tied to the uh, earliest uh, making use of these areas within the first three years of following a burn. Moving on towards season, this is uh, used to be. Uh, um, uh, we're doing a lot of burning and during the winter. Uh, now they're starting to shift over towards uh, trying to burn when Mother Nature burned. Um, again, it's a lot of thought that a lot of these fires were spawned by lightning strikes that occurred um, in, in the southeast. Uh, we have uh, in Florida the highest strike density of any place on, on, in North America. And we look at uh, these data show when burns are taking place on the Apalachicola National Forest south of Tallahassee. Um, most of the burning that are done by done by people, the anthropogenic fires are in the February through May period, uh, with a heavy focus on March and April. And the lightning season fires tend to occur later later down there, it's beginning sort of in April and May, and then tapering off in June and into September. And it's been um, a move, though, because it's thought that Mother Nature burned at this time to shift some of the management towards lightning season fires. There's actually some good support of this in the Gene Huffman's work. Uh, because there are two different growth patterns in each annual ring of a tree, Gene was able to look and see when the uh, scars, whether, uh, scars occurred, whether it was in a period when the wood was dormant or when it was growing. And, um, as you can see, most burns that she found were associated with periods when the trees were actively growing, suggesting you know, that these lightning occurred later outside the dormant season. You can also see in the response of vegetation. Uh, here we have a shot from a track where we work, um, the Wade Tract again, which shows two a pretty strong response by the wiregrass to a fire set at different times. And these fires actually were only set uh, two weeks apart. On the left-hand side, the fire was put in on April 10th, and on the right-hand side is April 27th. And this is a shot taken in September of, of that year later on, just showing how dramatic the flowering response of the wiregrass was to the slight difference in when the fire came through. Working within the looking at the rainfall patterns uh, and lightning strikes, the in this slide, the circle shows in period in April through May when we tend to run into a dry conditions here in the southeast, and the, the square polygons the histogram shows when lightning strikes start to pick up. And there's a lot of focus right now on what we call these transition season fires, which occur right in this really narrow period from April through June, when it looks like historically there was likely to be a lot of uh, uh, fires initiated by lightning through, the, uh, through this very period right here. The terminology for all this stuff, growing season, lightning season, and transition season, is a bit a bit vague. Um, you know, growing season is for where I live and where we are here in Tallahassee is basically March to October. So if you talk about doing a growing season burn, you could be burning in the late March and accomplish that. Lightning season has a very broad window. We have uh, lightning season fires and fog that sometimes kick up in February, but uh, it's not really um, a very good de definition. But this transition season kind of focus on a narrow period through April for, through June. And um, there's a lot to be done yet to get this terminology nailed down. But regardless of that, the move towards later season burning has caused a little bit of concern among some land managers about what you might be doing to some of the birds that nest in these pine forests, particularly shown here uh, on the top slide, the red and blue histograms of when the lightning and human fires again occurred on the national forests, and below, the, uh, showing the period where there's a lot of nesting taking place. And this area, again, from this April through uh, late June and early July periods, where there's a lot of nesting activity taking, there's a lot of lightning season or transition season burning taking place, and managers have been kind of concerned what effect this may have on, on birds. For bobwin sparrows, for example, the uh, conventional wisdom was that breeding season burns uh, reduce nesting success and population numbers. This was based on a study where they used radio telemetry to follow birds and um, basically found that birds abandoned areas didn't return, uh, and also there was no breeding activity uh, that occurred in the areas where they subjected to a May burn. Um, it's important to note that the radios for these birds only last about 30 days, so it was a very narrow window of time over which that study could monitor the birds, and they weren't monitoring the birds that moved back into the area once the fire was completed to see how they were doing. We've done, again, a lot of work on the Bachman sparrows, and again, if you're burning out two years 
post uh, last burn, most of the nests are in the area that you burned uh, last year, not the area that you're planning to burn this year. So putting a fire in, uh, even during the breeding season, really isn't going to affect a lot of nests. Unfortunately, there are a lot of singing males out there that are um, making themselves very well known, but uh, it's best to think of those as being the loser males because there's not a whole lot of nesting activity that's taking place. Uh, you'll, in fact, these the loser males that are having attractive mates because the vegetation structure is so bad, um, they sing more frequently uh, trying to call attention to themselves than to the birds that are successfully nesting. So um, a lot of concerns about this bird um, based on counts of singing males. Um, it, the males tend to leave about two years after a fire, but they tend to lag when the females are using the area by about six months sometimes. So uh, it's best to focus on the nesting activity that we see, which is again is concentrated in that period within the first 12 to 16 months after a fire has uh, been introduced. Again, nesting Bachman sparrows use the areas burned last year, not the two or three year roughs that you're planning to burn this year. The other thing about Bachman sparrows is a very long breeding season this bird has. It's actually uh, to some extent longer than the non-breeding season. The earliest nest we've recorded in our region was in March 21st and the latest fledged nest we had in late September in one year. So again a very long breeding season. Fire that goes in in May or June. Uh, vegetation has plenty of time to recover to provide birds in that setting with, uh, with uh, structure to nest, uh, re-nest. Also, uh, we've done some work looking at how quickly some breeding birds uh, return to areas following a breeding season burn. Uh, one conducted on May 25th. We uh, conducted four surveys prior to the burn and then nine afterwards, uh, visiting about every five, seven days. Here's what quail look like on this particular uh, study. Um, the numbers were quickly higher uh, four to six weeks after burn than they were during the pre-burn area. Again, quail, like Bachman sparrows, really pick out these areas that have the open vegetation structure at ground level. And it's, it's more important that you're really creating habitat for this bird when you burn two to three years out, not uh, affecting the bird's nesting habits so much, um, but you're really creating a suitable habitat for it. And again, the short-term setbacks that might be created or tend to be outweighed by the long-term gains for both of these species. Um, they'll move into a burned area within four to six weeks after the burn and make use of it for the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Another thing about burns, uh, later season burns in that sort of May through June period, it's, June is when quail in our area really start kicking up and have a lot of, lot of, lot of nesting activity. Um, so, but then the conducting the burns in the May through June when you can actually help to uh, reduce exposure for this bird, as I'll show in the next couple of little slides here. In one study we did on one of the properties here, um, we looked at the, uh, we tagged 50 quail, quail and then looked at nesting success of um, the survivorship. And looking at this graph, you can see in the 2006 period, there were a lot of these burns, uh, all the gray areas were, all the burns were conducted in March and April. So a lot of the area was uh, turned to black um, within a very short time period during the early part of the, um, of the year. Uh, basically from March 3rd to roughly April 15th, the entire area was burned. And you can see on the right the survival characteristics of the females uh, uh, at that point dropping significantly down to less than 15% within just a couple months after they were tagged. Below shows the extension of, um, of the burning conducted the following year. And if you'll note in some of the gray areas, again, depicting the areas burned, you'll see three June burns that were conducted. These were conducted eight to uh, eight weeks or more after some of the burns conducted in March and April. Uh, by the time that these June burns had taken place, some of those burns in March had already recovered to the point that they were fairly, uh, uh, totally usable by, um, by quail. And you can see on the corresponding survivorship on the right-hand side that the quail survivorship was much higher up until the June period. And as we like to say here, um, um, nesting quail, um, a, a dead quail can't produce eggs. And so the, having that high survivorship through that period provided a much greater nesting activity, even though there was burns conducted during what we would think of as being the breeding season for this bird. Again, hen survivorship was 70 to 67 percent better in 2007 than it was the previous year when most of the air was blackened up during a, a short period of time. 
And there's another factor too. Um, there are a lot of species that nest very early in the year. Right now we're uh, pretty busy studying brown-headed nuthatches here on tall timbers. We have five nests that have already fledged and we have about uh, another 50 right now that have either eggs or nestlings uh, in, in the nest. There's a picture of the brown-headed nuthatch. It's basically a big head with a small body to, to get the head through the canopy. Cavity nesting bird that nests very low. It look, picks out the softest punkiest uh, wood because it doesn't have a very, uh, it excavates a cavity anew each year and it's very, instead of selecting very soft wood to place these cavities in because it doesn't, you can't really work with very hard dense wood. It tends to nest very low, low to the ground. Uh, we find a lot of nests below three feet uh, and some nests um, um, down, we had one nest last year that was literally six inches off the ground. As you can imagine, um, if you're not nesting, um, if you're nesting during the burning season, um, this thing, uh, if you burn in winter, this in February and March, a lot of these snags that this bird uses are going to be burned up. And so it can uh, put a stomp on the, uh, the populations. And one important thing for about this bird, unlike backman sparrows, they tend not to re-nest. Uh, re-nesting is very rare in this bird because the further you go into the nesting season, or in, into the year, uh, the greater the uh, predation risk from snakes and other things that get into these cavities. Here we show uh, two females. We find this regularly each year, two or three females that are uh, basically taken by snakes. At their, and it happens particularly if these birds are nesting much and in, uh, longer into late April. So again, uh, breeding season fires can, uh, f can actually help out this bird by putting fires in to, to an area after they've completed their nesting activity. There's also the issue too with the later season burning in um, May and into June that you get a really lush flowering response by a lot of different uh, seed producing plants, uh, particularly grasses. And this is seen from that slide we had of the wiregrass uh, a little earlier, just showing the lush re flowering response that species had. And this can prove it beneficial as well to, to some species. Uh, we've done counts, for example, of Bachman sparrows in winter. The bright red areas show where we had our highest counts and the gray polygons behind that show which area was burned uh, just before those winter counts were taken during the uh, breeding season. So again, by breeding, uh, uh, burning uh, later in the year, you can provide grasses that the species use. And you can basically see how the uh, um, Bachman sparrows flip-flop here using the area that was most recently burned had a better seed production than, uh, than the other area. So again, burning um, later in the year can help Bachman sparrows. You're not necessarily burning up nests, and you're also perhaps providing better winter habitat for the bird. A really practical reason to consider lightning season burnings is just um, the more effective control they have on hardwoods. It creates great conditions for the establishment of longleaf pine seedlings. When those seeds come down in October and November, you have open ground conditions that allow the seeds to hit. And for me, the really big thing is it expands the window of opportunity for burning. Um, and it allows you chances to burn uh, more acres in a given year. A lot of these issues about the lightning season burning and birds, we've summarized in a small, uh, a popular little pamphlet that, uh, called Lightning Season Burning, Friend or Foe of Breeding Birds. And you can find this on our Tall Timbers web page under some of our publications. And it's, a, it's written in a sort of, kind of layman's fashion so that you can, uh, if people wonder why, birders wonder why you're burning during the nesting season or something, you can share this with them and uh, explains pretty well why it is it that uh, fires at any time of the year are, are better than no fires at all. Scale. This is a, something that's become a, a hot topic here in recent years. And how large should you be burning um, and what effect might that have on some of these birds? A lot of this stems from some work done on quail, um, particularly at tall timbers. We've been experimenting with the effect that scale has on quail productivity and survival for, for about um, 10 years now almost. Um, the quail folks uh, burn, uh, suggest burning at the smallest scale possible to improve bobwhite survival and productivity. We've done some work here on tall timbers where we've looked at 25 acre versus 50 acre burn blocks. Um, you can see here in the slide, there were higher numbers of quail in the smaller uh, burn blocks than in the larger burn blocks, but there's also a good bit of overlap there. There's been some more extensive work done in central Florida where they looked at 25 acre burn blocks versus 100 acre and also looked at the effects of growing season and dormant season burns within these larger, uh, within the burn extent experiment. This occurred down a scape ranch down in the uh, southeast uh, part of the states. 
they state there's a lot of um, overlap again, but basically these small burn blocks tended to have trends which are consistent with the small blocks being better. The quail productivity tended to be better in the smaller burn blocks. Quail being thought to be a very sedentary species, uh, these blocks uh, allow them to flop over, switch from one area to an another really quickly, and uh, increase their productivity and the um, uh, survivorship of the hens. Also, the general abundance shown, again, uh, tended to be uh, higher on the smaller scale burn blocks. There's, uh, you'd think that it also would have been better on the medium-sized burn blocks than on the large, but there's a lot of uh, overlap there. But in general, these trends held up, and the, uh, some more recent work the, uh, done on quail uh, down in the Web Wildlife Management area, they have a little stronger uh, case for making uh, the importance of small uh, burn blocks for quail. We've looked at this with Bachman sparrows, uh, looking at 25 acre versus 200 acre burn blocks here in our region on uh, two different sites shown here. We did this in 2005 and 2006. And unlike the radio telemetry study that, um, um, that we, I talked about earlier, um, this, we based this on color mark birds, which allowed us to track them throughout the year and over multiple years to look at the effect that these different scale effects had on, on the species. Basic take take home message here <clears throat> that we just, there was very the only statistically significant thing was that the males were more uh, more dense on the uh, high scale the um, large scale burn blocks that is that they were lower densities on the small scale burn blocks there were some tendencies too that generally said suggested that the large scale burn blocks uh, were a little bit better the home range size was a little smaller. The site fidelity was actually lower on the small scale blocks. The birds more moved uh, larger distances and more frequently on the small scale blocks. Uh, so just a couple of things just suggesting that, that um, 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 this large scale blocks in this particular study were, were a little bit more uh, favorable to Bachman sparrows. I think one of the differences is, as you see here, uh, quail, Bachman sparrows, that each of these species has different sort of behaviors. And that the, for Bachman sparrows, particularly the post-burn social conditions may make it difficult for areas that are in, uh, the birds that are in burned areas to quickly move into um, any unburned areas nearby. So if you think about it again, this bird's making use of the most recently burned site you have. So they're really flooded in in the area that was burned the previous year. And up on the left, if you're conducting a burn in that area on the left, uh, and uh, the, the birds that were displaced by that burn, they really can't move into that area where all those the territorial males are. And they may have to be just uh, try to uh, fly farther to, to, to find space. And when you have this sort of thing uh, taking place at smaller and smaller scales, the birds that are in the smaller scale blocks may actually have to move farther and uh, may not have as strong a site fidelity there because of the social conditions uh, surrounding them. Again, the territorial males may inhibit the use of the birds' abilities to use the unburned sites. Another big thing with burn blocks is, of course, the effect it has on what you can burn. Um, it takes a lot more time, typically, to burn um, uh, at smaller scales. Uh, here's a quote from a biologist in the Apalachicola, retired now talking about how the, it took them five extra days to burn the acreage they normally burn in a day because of some work they were doing trying to look at the effects of scale down there. And this is really important given the fact that we're generally not meeting some of our burn goals on a lot of public lands and the uh, reducing the extent can affect the, your ability to, uh, to achieve uh, burn goals. We're um, uh, one place, though, again, also where uh, smaller burn blocks is, uh, being, are being burned, uh, re recommended for the Florida grasshopper sparrow. This is a critically endangered subspecies found in south central Florida. Uh, shows a picture of a bird singing in the prairie down there. Some of the work that suggests right now that to burn often, we know like Bachman sparrow that this bird needs very recently burned areas, but they're also recommending a burn small and sort of 300 acre units. And they're finding that, that these males tend to um, um, show strong site fidelity, stronger site fidelity, and they think that by burning at small blocks you may be able to retain males in the areas rather than causing them to, uh, to move great distances. One place where they're trying out some of this, uh, there are a couple places, there's three lakes they're doing, wildlife management area, they're doing, uh, looking at the 300 acre and smaller burn units, but also just to give you some idea how you might approach um, looking at smaller burn uh, units is shows a slide from Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park at their burn units and you can see they're fairly large uh, approaching 2,000 acres or so uh, but they've been looking at uh, trying to uh, make smaller units on the portion of the prairie preserve and this for example shows a hypothetical uh, 
some smaller burn blocks within some of the larger burn blocks they have. I guess if you're interested in trying this out, what my recommendation would be is to make sure that you put these near the equipment barn um, so that you can do, conduct a small scale burn. And in this particular situation, you may actually be able to uh, meet your acreage goals uh, more efficiently if you have some afternoon, for example, where you've only got a few hours and you're burning a small block near the equipment barn, you may be able to get a block, um, you know, covered that you wouldn't have normally covered uh, if it had been a larger block. Uh, larger burn blocks are also being uh, recommended for species in scrub. Um, this is a high intensity fire system where basically the canopy is removed by the fires that are set. And a lot of species like the southeastern kestrel and Florida scrub jay prefer areas that are burned in larger blocks down in the in scrub habitat. So the take home message from all of this is this the interest, um, and here shows a picture of a high intensity scrub burn. And note in the background there, you can see the very tall uh, pines that were uh, uh, there before the burn. Uh, a lot of those tall pines like that, uh, sand pines, can uh, harbor predators for some of the species, particularly scrub jays. And so having a larger burn unit can help out scrub jays by reducing the extent of those uh, smaller woody patches that they uh, have surrounding their, their preferred conditions, which are more open. The basic take home message from this is that the effects of scale are likely vary by system and focal species. Um, again, there's some very pretty good information for quail suggesting that smaller scale burns are beneficial here on tall timber as we burn at 40 acre blocks uh, for primarily to help enhance the quail numbers. Uh, at other areas uh, where you um, are looking for scrub jays, you might want to think about 1,000 acre plus 2,000 acre burn blocks at a minimum to help uh, help out that species. So again, got to know your system, and it's this type of effect is going to vary by uh, system and the focal species. Final component, the ignition pattern. Um, Again, unfortunately, there's not enough work, a lot of work on this done here in the southeast in particular. We're certainly not burning today in order to reach our acreage goals, quite like Mother Nature burn. Um, and so we have uh, uh, multiple flame loops coming together. And um, there's actually one report of a quail, uh, a published report of a quail actually being burned up as a result of some of the fire um, uh, ignition patterns. We really don't have a great amount of uh, information it's been suggested it's ill-advised to have lightning on all sides of a burn ringing at uh, uh, the area as a primary cause of entrapment, and this may be well be, but again, we don't have a lot of great information here. One system where we do have some information on fire uh, effects of this type are in marsh systems here in the southeast. There's been some work done with coastal marshes in particular, suggesting some of these uh, long flame leaves like this may pose some, some threat to certain species. Some work done on Merritt Island found that black rails, for example, uh, they don't tend to uh, fly away, but they tend to try to run away from fires, and uh, they can increase mortality when you have these very long flame leaps coming together. So um, this is, um, again, how we started, talking about frequency, season, scale, and ignition pattern. And this is the order in which, uh, to me, they're most uh, should be considered, the frequency being the top priority in any system that we have here, making sure you're choosing a, a, a frequency that matches that of the species of, of concern. And for the pinelands we've been talking about, it's a two to three year uh, frequency season. I put that as second because season can help, as I mentioned, can help extend the burn window so that you're burning larger acreages each year by ex extending the amount of time you have to burn. And then scale can sometimes put a damper on the amount of acreage that you burn. So I put that as third. and ignition pattern. It's just something we don't know a whole heck of a lot about yet, for, particularly for pinelands to, to make much of a statement about. Again, frequency above all. And one way to sort of think about this is in looking at uh, the burn units uh, and what I call keeping the good good. This shows the Carolina Sandhill uh, National Wildlife Refuge and their uh, return intervals on some of their pineland stands. By keeping the good good, uh, I think that you um, Basically, each year you look at those two to three year return intervals and you make those the priority to try to keep those in that two to three year return interval. Once you get past five years, um, there's not much difference between a five plus six or seven year burn as far as some of these species go. And so in, in this setting, the priority is just to keep those uh, 
good areas in the good and focus a lot of your burning on those two to three year frequencies. And if you can, get a couple of those four year areas each year and move those into the more frequent status. But again, sort of keep your focus on those maintaining that good, uh, good frequency that you have in some areas or else you may just be simply doing a, a less than great job over a larger area. In this system, lack of fire is a disturbance, and that's something we have to keep in mind always. And getting the fire on the ground as frequently as you can is the most important consideration. Now, it's also important to monitor, and we have some tools that we've developed that are being applied on a lot of public lands uh, to look at species such as nuthatches, bachman sparrows, and quail uh, to keep track of um, these species. Uh, this is available uh, on the website, and anyone, uh, you don't need to know a lot about the birds. Um, in fact, uh, we have people who know nothing about either species doing very, gathering very effective data and making use of this uh, monitoring procedures. For example, in the uh, Carolina Sandhill National Wildlife Refuge, they hired a intern right out of college who didn't have much experience with birds and this person went out and collected the data uh, in about two months uh, and on the looking at Bachman sparrows and how frequently they, they were detected at these points and if you look on the right hand portion graph here showing the box plots of uh, sparrow detection plotted on the x-axis is the number of burns that have been conducted uh, since 2001 or between the period 2001 to 2011 that's a 10-year period, so the five-year uh, maximum number of burns, that basically is a two-year fire return interval in those areas. You can see the clear response the sparrows had on this, uh, on, on this particular site. And this provides land managers with a good sense of you know, how um, frequently, the, uh, how frequent fires benefit species such as Bachman sparrows. Well, that's it. I appreciate your attention. And um, again, these are wide open pine grasslands and our beautiful forests and support some of our uh, highest native uh, species richness for plants and, and also for uh, things like such as birds. And the important thing is to keep their uh, fire, keep fire on the ground as frequently as you can. And I hope that uh, everyone, if the weather is good where you are uh, later today, is planning to uh, light a fire once the relative humidity drops a little bit lower. So again, thanks for your attention, and I guess we'll try to figure out how to answer questions here. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Uh, for those of you who joined us during the presentation, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. And we just had a great uh, presentation from Jim Cox, uh, head of the Stoddard Bird Lab here at Tall Timbers Research Station. So as Jim said, um, we have a few minutes left in our hour today, and if you guys have any questions uh, for Jim, please go ahead and type them in the chat pod in the lower left hand see, side of your screen. I see, one, I see one question about turkeys there. Yeah, in, that, in that publication I mentioned, there has been at least two studies of turkeys done that show again that you're not burning up very many turkey nests with the fires that are set later in the year. And one of the uh, kind of interesting thing is uh, you know, people worry about turkeys greatly, but if you go out and um, a lot of turkey hunters will walk into a, a public land management unit and they'll ask, uh, show me your burn map from last year so that they'll know where the best places to hunt turkey might be. But there's been uh, two or three studies done on turkey uh, that are mentioned in that uh, uh, lightning season burning for bird book that I've uh, mentioned. Yeah, I think we had a uh, webinar last year, the year before, with Chris Mormon from NC State. And uh, he had some evidence from uh, the effects of growing season burns and, and turkey nests up from up in the North Carolina area that also you might want to check out. Yeah, there's one about the scrub jays, the large scale burns, thousands of acres, uh, and those displacing jays. Yeah, the, the, the site I was looking at there was the Ocala National Forest. The, the scale effects you have to sort of uh, basically look at your each management unit uh, individually. Uh, if you're talking about a 500 acre area, you don't want to burn the entire thing up uh, in a given year. Uh, and because the large scale burns will displace jays, but again, uh, at, at, um, at the, the Ocali, again, some larger scale burns might be helped to reduce the uh, predators that uh, tend to um, um, come into some of those, uh, once those sand pines get up pretty high. There was a question early on. Uh, looks like they're really coming in now. Uh, on the variability in um, uh, fire severity and fire intensity, it's kind of a, the next step. Could you comment on that? 
Yeah, yeah. We, um, I, I agree. There's a lot of work to be done there. You know, Mother Nature burned throughout the 24-hour clock. Um, the sapphires we're setting today are when the relative humidity is very low. And I think that's, again, some of the small, the benefits of small-scale burning relate to that. Uh, the fact that there, there was a more patchy mosaic of burns uh, historically. Uh, you know, the, we sometimes let burns on the way track go into the night, and uh, some of those just go out. And so, it's very, um, very important to realize that that component is missing in the way we're burning right now. Um, I still think that the frequency. You know, the people ask what scale you should burn at. I said whatever it takes you to maintain a three-year or more frequent fire interval on your unit, and again, if there's ways to achieve that by um, you know having a, a, a small scale burn units next to the uh, barn where you can haul equipment out as needed on a very quick basis to get some burning done, that's great. Uh, but we also need to maintain the the high frequency burning um, uh, over larger areas in order to meet the acreage goals. A uh, question about some of the results of these studies available online. The pamphlet that I mentioned has a list, of, has all the references in it, and many of them are available online. Uh, referring back to the Turkey, for example, there was, a, I think, a thesis at Mississippi State University that is available online. And um, we also here at Tall Timbers have a uh, prescribed fire uh, database that you can go to and basically search through that database to see what information is. You can type in keywords such as wild turkey and fire, and it'll return all the publications. Um, and that's a good place to start, too, to figure out um, uh, areas where you have uh, different literature that might be available. Question about minimum size natural area capable of supporting population of Bachman sparrows. Um, they tend to occur at densities about one bird per five acres. And if you're thinking about 200 um, plus individuals as being a, a good size, well then you know, you're talking generally probably something into, into the 2,000 to 10,000 acre. Of course, if you're dealing with that size acreage, you wouldn't want to burn all of it at one time. You would want to break it up into small units. But uh, I think you could same, sustain uh, Bachman sparrows on a 2,000 to 10,000 acre range. There was a question early on, Jim. I think we met, it's been a little bit um, kind of referring to the idea of um, bird and nest detection bias uh, in burned and unburned sites, and, and whether or not that's something that can be um, accounted for statistically. Oh, that for that particular work on the, sp the sparrows, now that wasn't a factor. Um, we were searching the same amount of time in burned and unburned areas, and I can assure you that the uh, you can just be listening to the frequency with which the males were calling in the unburned area, um, excuse me, the, the area that had the uh, long unburned area, they were calling 30 times per, over a 10-minute period. That means that they're not they're not they're not hooked up they're not paired at that point, and that's uh, uh, so those detection issues weren't weren't really prevalent there. Uh, we were um, searching uh, assiduously throughout all all the sites that we were surveying. The hundred or thousand hour fuel impede nesting success in ground nesters in these areas. Um, one thing that does help out sometimes is that it often creates a fire shadow uh, on some of the uh, longer hour fuels. Uh, and sometimes the birds will uh, have a chance to um, make use of that little patch that's, uh, say, a downwind, if you will, of a fire coming through an area. Um, we tend to see um, not much impediment, uh, impediment to the, uh, the air places that I work. Um, uh, we don't see a lot, those areas aren't really a focus for predators and stuff. but uh, if, um, the only way that I see that they uh, affect things is by that uh, fact, the, the effect that they have on the vegetation structure by providing that little downwind uh, uh, area where sometimes the vegetation isn't burned out. Todd Angel asked about the relationship between winter season burning and higher predation rate. Um, we haven't seen that in the birds that I've worked at, worked with. Uh, the vegetation, of course, doesn't recover as quickly. Uh, and I guess I, I haven't done a lot of work in the winter season, uh, studying the winter season burning areas uh, personally, and I uh, really can't, can't talk about that. Yeah, 
I see. I'm thinking about Ryan's question. I wonder if he's uh, working in areas that are uh, actively working on um, restoration projects and potentially areas where that they're doing hardwood um, removal and, and there may be some some heavier fuels left on the site uh, that are getting consumed as part of that hardwood removal project. And if, if that's kind of the direction he's thinking. Well, yeah, if, the, if, the, if there's a heavy residual there, that's the, the birds probably you know, would be impeded by nesting. They need the open ground cover with the uh, you know, interstitial areas that are to move between the bunch grasses and stuff like that. The, uh, if the heavy downed material isn't removed, for example, in grasshopper sparrows, there's some recent work done on looking at roller chopping and the uh, thatch that was left afterwards. Uh, if it was set there, the birds would not use the area quite as uh, readily as they would the areas you know where burning had removed that. I guess it's possible um, if if those areas were part of a hard road removal project in a restoration phase, that the uh, the birds might not be there anyways. <laughs> Yeah, and there's also the hurricane issue. There's been with uh, uh, with Backman Sparrow some work done on looking at the effect of hurricane damage afterwards, or the you know the heavy fuels that are left on behind that. And removal of those had some benefits too. Again, trying to restore those uh, grassland conditions. So you know the uh, the heavy fuels, the hundred and thousand hour fuels that might be left behind by a you know a catastrophic event, definitely going to affect the uh, affect these species. All right, well, looks like we are getting close. We have about time for one or two more questions. Looks like there's one from Andy there. Yeah, late growing season fire. Let's see. Um, I'm not as sure about the late growing season fire as having the same, all the same benefits, but I, again, I'm a person who likes to think that frequency, again, um, trumps the other considerations um, and getting the fire in there as frequently as you can is a big uh, the big issue uh, bigger issue here once you've got that then you can fine-tune it by season but again um, I, I would prefer to see an area burned at least sometime rather than left to go for um, a long on burn period that's great well thanks so much Jim for your presentation today I'm gonna switch our layout here and bring up your contact information for anybody who needs it and uh, a link to do a short survey to uh, give us all, and Jim as well, some feedback on, on what you thought of the presentation today and, um, and how we might be able to, to shape our and plan our future webinars so that we're meeting everyone's fire science needs. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. Great presentation. Mm -hmm.